All right. Well, welcome back like usual. Luke, if you want to come on up while we're talking. All right. We've got the uh, spring equity fund reports. We've got four of them today. We're going to start off with Meridian Biosciences. And so it's typical in our format. Luke, if you could talk us through how you came upon this company, if there's a question out there that everyone keeps asking, if you just want to put to bed for once or something you didn't get a chance to resolve, from there on, we'll take it to Q&A. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Luke Honeke. Um, I'm in the Applied Investment Management Program here at Marquette. Um, I'm pitching Meridian Bioscience, which is at, currently at a price of $25.77. And I have it at a target price of $41.35 with upside of 60%. Um, Vivo is a domestic healthcare company that creates both molecular regents and diagnostic tests. So regents are chem chemical compounds that when added to the diagnostic test create a chemical reaction that shows the presence of a disease or an illness. Um, Vivo is split into two groups, with the life sciences group, which creates the regents and the antigens and the antibodies, and then the diagnostics group, which creates the actual hardware for the test. Uh, life science is 59.8% of revenue, and then diagnostics is 40.2% of revenue. Um, and then how kind of found Vivo was fact set screening, you know, looking at healthcare companies with a relatively small market cap that had an EV to EBITDA, um, around like 12 or under 12 um, and this is a financially healthy company and then i was also just really interested in what they did and i was eager to kind of learn more um, i think the main question i received on d2l was about my peer group um, which i included neogenomics neogen beckton dickinson and company and biorad laboratories um, and beckton dickinson and company and biorad laboratories are much larger companies um, and the reason i included this was because in meridian's 10k um, they're listed as main competitors. So they also create, or I think, yeah, Becton Dickinson creates molecular regents and then um, BioRed Laboratories creates diagnostic assays. Um, yeah, so from there, I'll come to questions. All right, we're looking for questions. Yep. Yeah, kind of going off of that, um, what kind of proprietary or IP, that sort of thing, do uh, your company hold compared to those much larger peers that would give them a competitive advantage over those larger peers? Yeah, so I think that starts at first with kind of the product innovations so that just recently came out with something they call the air drivable master mix, which is a region that um, instead of you, the um, instead of using biofilization, which is the typical um, way to test for or to use PCR tests, and that's kind of a lot longer process. Air drying mixes takes about 15 minutes to get a test and to get the region ready to be put in the, um, into the assay. So that um, is kind of just the innovation that they have and that I think helps them stand out. Is that like patent in any, any sort of like protection of that idea or concept? Um, I, I would have to get back to you on that, but um, they just recently came out with it, so. Perfect, thank you. Andrew? Um, yeah, so I kind of want to keep building on this topic of patents. Um, do you know how their legal defense team is? Do they have an in-house counsel or a of house? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. And do they have any outstanding litigations against the company? Or do they do not have that? Uh, they do not, no. Joe? No, my question. Ah. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Yes, sir. Can you just touch on the recalls that you have to risk? Yep. So in um, 2021, they recalled their lead care assay, which is um, a test that tests for the amount of level of lead in the blood. Um, and the reason they voluntarily recalled this was because the tests were underestimating the amount of lead um, in the blood. So it is currently going through FDA approval and management is confident that they will get the um, say approved by the end of quarter two, 2022. Professor Walker, can you talk a little bit about how this company has grown uh, before COVID and how you expect this company to grow after COVID? Yeah, so before COVID they, um, Focus on gastrointestinal assays, which include their H. pylori um, tests. And then that was the main kind of growth of their revenue, and that's where a lot of their revenue came from. Um, and then including their blood assays with lead care um, that kind of helped them grow. And then once COVID hit, obviously PCR tests were in high demand, and that um, boosted their revenue a ton. Um, and then after COVID, I think with the addition of the air travel mixes and Kind of the new technology that they have um, rolling out, I think that will continue to grow revenue even after COVID. Can you quantify that growth rate? Yep. So for the H pylori, um, I'm sorry, you look at like the previous before COVID came up, what was the five year five year growth rate revenue wise? Um, I believe pre pre 2019. Mm -hmm. 
mean, from in 2019 to 21, 21, there was a 25% growth rate. I do not have the numbers for 25. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I have a similar question, right? Have you valued uh, what this thing looks like? What's the COVID effect? In other words, if COVID tests go away, do you know what in a per share price, what that means to this company? Or, or can you give me some color on, on what that means to this company? So did you? Yeah. I think the main, like the main thing was even um, in COVID in 2021, the uh, non-COVID sales in the life sciences segment were up 30%. So I think the revenue that and uh, that they might receive from COVID will help kind of grow these other segments, I think. That's not what I'm asking. If you assume other with respect to Dr. Krause's BA2 that he's spreading the gospel on. Once that comes and goes in, say, a year, if, if this does not continue to mutate and the tests are not needed, what would that mean to your, your stock? Can you give me any kind of quantitative answer? Um, I, not quantitative, no. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, how do you feel about the upcoming uh, earnings report in which sales are expected to be 20% down year over year? And like, do you think that would like affect their major holdings? Um, well, so the earnings report came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that was for quarter one, 2022. I, I believe that the quarter two, 2022 will be even higher because including the PCR test that, you know, in the from the Omicron variant and the demand from that, um, I believe that that will actually boost revenue and, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Uh, can you talk about the short interest for a little bit? I know this guy held up around six and a half percent. Can you talk about if that's uh, an activist campaign and what's driving that? Yes, um, mainly by, um, by the certain funds that hold the majority of that. For the short interest, I believe it is held by um, the founder who was, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have his name. Um, I believe he holds the majority of the short interest. The founder is short? No. The founder would own insider share. Oh, I'm sorry. Short interest would be <laughs> yeah. like hedge funds that think it should go down. So hopefully the founder thinks it's going up. Oh, yeah, I do not have the funds that are yeah. Uh, just kind of go off and cross your walls a little bit, but um, the PCRs, I know is a big value for like the last couple of years. What did you model that future years? Did you have it retracting? How much do you have it retracting? Or what do you do for the PCRs? Well, PCRs can be applied to certain, a lot of diseases and illnesses. So I believe with COVID and a lot of people have seen that PCR tests are extremely effective and quick. I believe that that will actually transfer to um, other diseases and be used a lot more um, Widespread, and then so are you still growing the PCR tests from COVID levels? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, can you help me kind of understand what's going on with your margin that you're expecting in 2022 operating margin growth is going to be two percent, but then in 2023 it's jumping all the way to 20. And then 8.4 in 2024, where your operating margins are remaining relatively the same? Yep, that's because of how I modeled kind of an increase in research and development costs, especially in 23 and 24. Um, and then also marketing expense, which they are, um, when they're trying to build the testing market for each priority, they're going to do a lot of education and um, try to get a lot more exposure to that, uh, that system that they um, produce. Um, and then I think. Yeah, that's pretty much the main thing. Research involved. Yep. You mentioned in your drivers that 33% um, of revenue came from three customers. Um, do you see that as a risk? And are there any like contracts with those customers? Um, or are there any uh, like competitors that might be able to undercut pricing and potentially uh, lose those customers? So I just want to know about that. Yeah, I do believe it is a risk. However, these customers have been coming to Meridian for I think the past five or six years. So there's a level of trust between Meridian and the customers, and they believe that Meridian provides a great product. Gotcha. Hey, look, nice job. Okay, we've owned this before. We've had some success with it. So it's good to see the ticker back and play again. Um, this is probably a tough company to cop and to find peers because of what's been going on in the market recently. I see you used an E1010 valuation approach, DCF, to your relative. Um, talk a little bit about your peer comps and why you chose 80 10 10. Yeah, so if, I think the main reason I chose 10 10 was because 
of how large Beckham Dickinson and Company and Byron Laboratories are. So I think while you know I still weigh them all the same, um, because they create the same products, um, I think that the main reason that I did 10 10 was because of how large they are and how that could come off as skewing the average. Last question, uh, your wife, which reasonable given the beta and low levels of debt? It appears you didn't add any type of risk premium to this. I added a hundred base points. Did you? Inflation. And based on inflation. inflation. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. All right. Perfect. We're going to hear a bit about a company most people have probably heard of, Logitech. Well, Kevin's making his way here. Keep your questions ready. So to speak, and Kevin, I think you know the routine by now. Help us understand why you chose Logitech. And then if there's either one question everyone keeps asking, um, or there's one that you think deserves address, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> I'm Kevin Igo, the junior on the Applied Investment Management Program with Marquette. Um, the stock I'm pitching today is Logitech International SA, ticker LOGI. Uh, a little bit about the business they operate in four main business segments. Gaming is made up there, a couple brands, Astro Gaming, Streamlabs. Um, video collaboration is 20%. They just acquired Mevo to help grow this section. Keyboards and combos, 15%, and other 42%. Um, I'm pitching it with a current target price of $104.34. Representing an upside of 41%. Um, diving into how I screened for Logitech, I was looking for a company with PE under 20 near the industry average for the tech sector. I originally started with Canadian Solar because they're strong financials and recent investment in a strategic partnership with Habitat Energy. Um, but then President Biden extended the Trump era tariffs on solar panels in foreign countries, and 20% of Canadian Solar's revenues came from the United States. So then I went back to my screening process, looked for a company PE under 20, sales growth over 10% for the past five years, and Logitech came up and I was familiar with the name. I saw the recent acquisitions of Streamlabs and Evo, and I thought there was a lot of growth opportunity. Um, moving into some questions I received on D2L, um, there were a couple errors in my write-up in my valuation section. Um, so my models were weighted 85, 7.5, 7.5, not 80, 7.5, 7.5, like it says. And then my dollar amounts and my valuation are correct, but my pure multiples for my PE and my EV EBITDA were incorrect. They are what they are in the boxes down below at the bottom. Um, PE weighted average 12.49 and EV EBITDA 12.83. Um, also, my ROE in my box at the top of my write-up is incorrect. Their ROE the last 12 months 34.1%. The new peer average with that included is 29% or 33%. Um, and then going into some D12 questions. Um, they do their operations, their manufacturing operations in China. I got a question if I had any country risk premium. Uh, I did not, but this morning I factored in a 1% country risk premium in my WAC, uh, making my WAC 9.17%. And that could be the situatory price. Of $98.26, upside of $33. Um, I got a lot of questions about my EPS growth rate in 2023, being larger than my m term EPS growth rate. Uh, I relate this to my increase in my net income as my second driver. They are, Logitech is already three quarters through fiscal year 21, so my assumptions about my drivers getting off are going to be in 2023, so this growth of net income is what increases their EPS so largely. And then the decrease in their EPS in 2024 is due to my um, increase in research and development. All right, call that one. You got about 20 in there. Let's okay, switch yeah. over to you and A. That's yeah, right. that's fine. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. worries. Thanks. 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 Um, I'm looking at your box right now. I'm looking at your operating margin. It's very cyclical. Could you please explain that to me? Um, yeah, so my operating margin increasing 29%. 2023's biggest growth rate, I guess, but that's just because different costs in 2023, I increased um, the costs on their revenues, or on their, sorry, on their expenses because of acquisitions of information technology. So the acquisitions of information technology are expanding your margins by 9%? The acquisitions now? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I've, for 2022, yeah, I'm talking much below the 2023, sorry, 
Okay, because 22 is when you're happy. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, coming sorry. In, and that's going to lead to the expansion. Sorry about that. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. I know you guys are first. But it's great. Um, could you talk, touch on the risk, the third party problems? You say the distributors have the products and rely on their information. Probably. Yeah, just the distribution channel. Uh, uh, yeah, perfect. So, we haven't had any problem with third party distributors in the past. But as of right now, Amazon and Ingram Micro account for over a quarter of their um, distribution sales. So if relationships with these companies were to have an adverse effect, um, they would have to restructure their distribution process for about a quarter of their total sales. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, good job, Kevin. Can you kind of walk us through that? what makes up that other revenue segment, given how large it is? And then can you kind of go into your assumptions going forward for that, like your projections for that re revenue segment in the next periods or terms? Yeah, perfect. So um, that other revenue segment is made up, they have like smart home technology, their mobile phone speakers, mobile devices. Um, and yeah, so going into 2024, my revenue assumptions for the other segment were lower. That was my lowest assumption because I believe they will try and focus on the gaming. Yeah, but leverage. Like, like, can you give me a number on that? I'm just trying to understand where like all the revenue growth is coming segment by segment here. Yeah, I had I had um, the like, section growing by like five percent. Okay. Year. Hey, Kevin, great job. Um, I just want to ask a question. Uh, why does your company have a higher ESG rating compared to the industry average? Um, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so LargeTech uses recycled plastics in a lot of their products, specifically some of their mice, keyboards, and speakers. Um, more than 65% of those products in their large portfolio are made with recycled plastics. So far, they've eliminated an estimated 8,000 tons of virgin plastic, which is equal to about 19,000 tons of carbon dioxide saved across product life cycle, life cycle, and they're really trying to reduce their carbon. Awesome. Thank you. Joe? Uh, then, um, this child are releasing restrictions on gaming for uh, under minors and imposing other restrictions that we've talked about before. Have you seen any effects on that on large tech sales, and do you see any concerns? Um, yeah, so in the last 12 months, their sales in China have been down 26%. Um, China makes up 2.9% of their total revenue, um, just keeping that in mind. But the I don't really see it being a big problem because yeah. the under-18 um, age group in the Chinese gaming market only makes up about 5% of sales. Well, is this is going to be a softball. You should like this, right? <laughs> Here's a quote from the CEO of Roger. Quote, the metaverse is one of the biggest opportunities in the world of Yeah, yeah, well, I can work last week. I can go and learn how they're, I can learn how they're uh, trying to expand into virtual reality. Actually, one very interesting product they're moving on is they have a VR stylus that um, connects to like an Oculus with different types of headsets, which will really help manufacturing and health companies um, just design and process everything. Because you can draw it out and you can expand everything in 3D and it'll just help the design process for yeah. a lot of products. But that's the main VR product right now. And then some of their headsets uh, through Astro Gaming, their A40, TR, and A10 headsets are compatible with some of the largest brands of VR headsets. So yeah. we need a device that can not bounce around when one is in the metaverse. <laughs> I got to see last week watching that. Yeah. <laughs> First attempt recording. Give me a breath. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I was hoping you could shed some color into management and ESG. A double is pretty impressive. I was just kind of wondering if you could give some more color. Um, yeah, kind of what I touched on with Basil, just like they're trying, really trying to reduce their carbon footprint um, with using recycled plastics in their products and also. More so ESG, their Latch Cares program, helping their workers give back to the local communities. And um, for the management part of it, um, they just kind of set out their goal was just to reduce their carbon footprint. What did they do? Their goal was just to reduce their carbon footprint. So I, I have a question. So the CEO has been the CEO since 2013. However, uh, they had a new CFO come in in 2016. Do you know why the new CFO had to come in? Right. So... Uh, I just curious the CFO committed accounting fraud. 
or whatever. So I was wondering, like, had Logitech mentioned anything about, like, revamping, like, who the auditors were, or, you know, this, they maintained the same CEO. So I was kind of wondering. Um, um, I didn't come across it. Yeah. Uh, with them doing over 50 percent of the business outside the U.S., can you talk about any type of risk premium or premium that is here? Just because you guys seem to have it. Well, um, the only risk premium I have is my WAC. So, like, one of the cases points on my tax cost. Point of clarification. Point of clarification. Just to make sure. So the PE in the box is twelve four nine is right, right? Yeah. And the number calculated in here is correct. Yeah, I'm just so if I take twelve four nine times five sixty two, right? Well, I'm not getting to ninety five sixty six. Not even close, right? If you take, if we even if we round, I call that twelve or thirteen times five. I should be about seventy bucks. I got downside on the PE now. Is that right? Am I missing something? That is correct. Okay. Uh, Ooh, that's for us to think on your seat. Yep. Here's a good response. I'll get back to you, Dr. Walline. Yeah, Dr. Wall will get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit down at your cross. I'm simply asking you what 12 times 5 is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. You're up. All right. Could you talk about the e gaming? I think one, yeah, one of your drivers you talk about kind of e gaming is kind of blowing up. What did that look like, I guess, prior to COVID? Or, um, and then kind of moving forward, how do they plan to capitalize on the growing e-gaming aspect of their business? Um, yeah, well, perfect. Um, e-gaming is growing at crazy rates right now, and Logitech G, one of the brands under their gaming segment, is that is their main goal, is focusing on esports and professional gaming equipment. They actually sponsor about 30 professional gaming teams, showing that their products are the highest quality. Um, but I think that esports will also combine with Streamlabs and the view the viewing rate of streamers and content creators increasing. Um, so I just think all those combined will really increase their gaming revenue. There was one more back here. So what else? Is that it? All right. All right. Cool. The other CFA teams were presenting this. Professor Walker is, is a judge, so we already have a, a world class expert in the room. Oh, yeah, it was Johnson. Oh, was it? Oh, but it was, oh okay, but Garden was a competitor. Fair enough. But this would be a big one. So if you could take us with how you found this company, as well as, you know, if there's one big question out there you want to address, that'd be great. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, I will, if I introduce myself already, um, I'm Amy Gore, I'm a junior here at Marquette. Um, to serve uh, my screening process, it was rather simple. Um, I was just kind of looking for international uh, headquartered companies within the consumer discretionary sector. Um, I originally came across a company called Coca-Cola Euro Pacific Partners, um, big in Iberia, Germany, Great Britain, and France. Um, and the story really didn't fit. It uh, really wasn't that appealing to me. Um, <laughs> so I began to broaden my search, and I came across Garmin. Um, Running across five different segments, um, I thought it was a really interesting company. Uh, when I saw they had no debt, that was kind of a green flag for me. Um, they performed well against the S&P. Um, and then I went looking into their story. Um, and when you go back 10, 15 years ago, they were strictly an auto business, focusing on their GPS products. Um, and then the, great, or the financial crisis hit, um, and their stock dropped nearly 90%. Um, and unlike companies like BlackBerry and Kodak, uh, Garmin designed an innovation and they completely changed, flipped their business model uh, to be a fitness oriented company as well as expanding their segments into marine, aviation, outdoor, and also keeping the auto uh, segment. Um, I think one big question I got on D2L was about my peers, in particular Apple. Um, I think when you would see Apple on anybody's peer sheet, it kind of draws your attention just because they are one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, I would them at 40% for a number of different reasons. Uh, the first of which is their presence in the fitness world industry. Um, they own about 51.2% of the market share within there. Um, being direct competitor of Garmin. Um, I would say the difference between the two is Garmin focuses more towards the workout enthusiasts 
uh, such as your track and field runners, your cross country runners, as well as your um, street cyclists. While Apple is more of like a leisure watch, uh, more for style, but it can't have the features of tracking your heart rate, seeing how many calories you burn, etc. Um, additionally, they play a role in the outdoor and the auto segments. For outdoor, um, Gun has their own line of golf watches, though that has around 41,000 courses pre loaded into there. It'll tell you uh, the yardage is the front middle, back of the green. Uh, Apple can do the same features. The only difference is you would just have to download an app that could connect to your phone. Uh, and then with auto, if you've been in a car that's been made in the past couple of years, you'll see that they've included features such as Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Um, when you get in the car, you can connect it from Bluetooth uh, or via cord. And right away, you see your most used apps, uh, potentially what music you're just listening to, as well as a map, um, making navigation a little bit easier. Um, so that's where I saw the competition as uh, Apple was kind of drawing you away from needing that GPS device uh, connected to your windshield. Um, with that, I'll open up questions. So here's a good news, bad news teaching. Uh, bad news first. It's a logical fallacy to compare them to Apple. And here's why. The big guy with lots of branches is going to be seen as a competitor to many, many companies. But they don't see themselves as a competitor to your company, and it's only a small, teeny part of their business. And so when you play the comp game and you say, oh, yeah, they're a competitor of ours. Well, it's true, but is a fraction of revenues? It's irrelevant. So it's not a good comp because it doesn't match. And if you went the other way, you could say, oh, I modeled Apple and I took 10% of Garmin and I, I, I weighted it because it's that part of their business. That works, but the logical fallacy doesn't work the other way. It's the bad. The good news, take a look. PE basis, Apple's actually dragging down his pure average PE. It's dragging up. Uh, it's, it's right if you look at it. It actually would be higher without him including it. How'd you, how'd you roll into Boundless? I didn't look real quick. What were your methods? Um, I did BE and EBE EBITDA. Okay. EBE and EBITDA has the opposite effect. It drags it up, but they net cancel each other out. So he hasn't done himself any real damage with this approach, so it shouldn't really like change the valuation aspect. Fair, fair point. Sure. Sure. All right, now, Q&A. Yeah, just looking at the price chart you brought around here, a lot of volatility. Could you talk about what happened in September? I don't know why they didn't get down with slides and stuff. Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't download slides, so call it. Um, with the quarter three coming out, uh, all their segments were kind of positive growth. Um, so as for uh, share price, stock price, I'm not quite sure why they have gone down in that quarter. Let me get back to you on that. Is it, do you think it's possible they were overvalued by the market? This is a correction back to what market price should be. Um, I think it definitely it could be a possibility, yeah. You want me to do your whack and did you include any risk premium? So my whack is relatively a little low um, just because there is no cost of debt involved in it. So it is majority uh, cost of equity. Um, uh, my risk free rate was about 2.1. Market risk premium was 5.2. Uh, I was an expected market return of 4.8. Um, so that's how I came out with. Seven point zero nine. Who's three? Lost track. Who's three? Alright. One of your risks talks about foreign restrictions. Does management address doing business in China uh, and uh, production facility there? Uh, are they going to continue to do business there? Are they planning to grow businesses? So right now, um, China produces three point four percent of Garmin's revenue. Um, with the recent turmoil that's been going on, they haven't announced if they're going, what changes they're going to be making. Um, but what I will say, uh, in addition to the risk, is 85% of the revenues from Garmin come from Taiwan facilities, um, which could be a big risk given that they have four and they're planning on um, adding an additional facility there. Um, but I think this isn't just a uh, Garmin problem solely. Um, the fear is that. If China does uh, gain control of Taiwan, that they could um, restrict Taiwan from shipping goods to other countries uh, before China gets their goods, um, which could be a problem because 50% of the world's uh, semiconductor supplies come.
comes from Taiwan. So overall, yes, this is a government risk, but it could eventually lead to a global risk that forms over there. Yeah, great job, Andrew. Uh, can you walk me through uh, that the increase in operating margin from 22 to 23 kind of went, went into that assumption? Because I don't see anything up in your right up talking about any improvement of processes, anything that would indicate uh, margin growth. Uh, you know, we've seen that other people's models or all talk about kind of you know increasing SGNA, other things that would kind of drag down margin. So where is this margin growth coming from for government? Um, I would first say over the past from 2016 to 2020, the operating margins have been on a consistent growth. Uh, 2016, they were at 20.7%. Uh, 2018, they went up to 23.25%. But 2020, they at 25.18. Um, so my watch plan there is kind of keeping a consistent growth with it um, through 2022, I have it. Yeah. And then kind of increasing it slightly as the um, trend is shown to 2025. Yep. Why? Like, why is there like growing margins? Can management give any like indication or anything of like the type A and the type B? Okay, thank you. Um, in regards to your first drivers, basically, how is that? You like how'd you model that out? Did you like have any, any assumptions with it besides the flip Uh, yeah. So, let's see. Okay. Yeah, for me. Uh, in regards to my model, I did not factor in the acquisitions I mentioned in my model, but that does play a role in the valuation of the value that this company has, um, given the amount of cash on hand. And with their recent earnings coming out Wednesday, um, they've shown that they um, recorded more cash being on hand. Um, and I think, like I said, my write up with the acquisitions, it gives them an opportunity to continue to grow those segments, potentially their auto segment, which has been um, on a downward trend over the past couple of years, uh, but it certainly helped their uh, marine segment, which was up, I believe, I got this one on the right. The marine segment was up 33% year over year. So, okay, good job. So, uh, when you grew out your revenue, um, did that, did this, the way it was segmented change at all, or are those uh, segmentation of your revenue pretty much staying the same? The pleasures grew. Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, so you grow out, so you have 31% fitness and 27% outdoor. Did you see any changes of how, uh, how like any changes of like, this outdoor raising or lowering or can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so they just, again, like I said, they announced their earnings for uh, the year earnings, I might say. Um, they reported every segment having a double digit growth year over year. It's your sixth year in the world having that. Um, so I think with that in play, with them having a consistent growth over the last couple of years, that factored into my revenue growth over the last couple of years. Um, and the estimates I have are on par with what they estimated with 2021 coming in at $4.9 billion. Um, and they project that 2022 is going to be at $5.5 billion, a little over my estimate, 5.4.
characteristics of the company and not necessarily a driver of future growth. The reason is because, like you said, you're an Incan acquisition and leverage up. And the company said that, yes, you can use that case for, uh, for, for a driver, but um, be careful how you use your drivers. Make sure they always kind of relate directly to your income statement. Um, because there's oftentimes, they often, they, uh, characteristics how disguised as so the question I have is actually, um, what kind of company growth rate has this company had for pre-pandemic, uh, 2015 to 2019? The reason I ask that, we have many companies that have this huge growth revenue because of COVID. But it's gotta, there's got to be a hangover. There's got to be a growth hangover sometime in this future because not everything grows at a good rate. I'm just wondering if you can know, help me understand what the growth rate was pre-pandemic for the last five years. Right. Um, so the revenue growth rate from 2016 to 2020, uh, they were from 15 to 16, they were at 7%. They then dipped from 16 to 17 to 2%. Um, and since then, they've gone 8%, 12%, with a slight dip to 11%. Um, so they've stayed consistent throughout the pandemic. I was thinking about things that high single digit growth rate. Yeah, and I think that has to do with the idea that just the effects the pandemic had on us, everyone being at home, working out, wanting to get into the fitness world, call it, and looking for a product that can track their health metrics. Um, they did have a large growth this year at 19%, but I do model out them kind of slowing down that growth rate <coughs> to those mid single, that mid single digit. Yeah, what's up, Aiden? Nice job. Um, can you just talk about the, the like, uh, acquisition of First Beat and kind of like the COVID? Yeah, for sure. Uh, First Beat's a company that uh, basically takes technology within your watch, um, monitors your heartbeat patterns, um, and like I said in my write-up on Deep Flow uh, a couple of times, uh, it's able to detect the disease weeks before you show symptoms of it, um, which is nice for only more susceptible people to the disease. Um, and then with that, off that acquisition, they were working with Dexcom, um, which is a glucose monitoring uh, system company that uh, received that data approval to be able to put this technology in the launches. So I think based on that acquisition, it kind of grows government's options to the different technologies that they include, include in the wearables. Uh, we should have the watch on you. You're getting quite a workout here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may stand on the record. Uh, a little different angle here. Interesting company. Reinvented itself. And it still is going to face some challenges or changes ahead. I see that both founders are young. Okay. Kyle started in 89, um, as well as the co-founder was a software engineer back in 89. Any discussion about transition? Um, clearly two key people in the founding as well as the strategy throughout this company's history. Yeah, um, they have not discussed anything about uh, transition into the future. Um, that is something that down the line could become a potential, I wouldn't say risk, but an issue to... I think it is, I, I think it is a risk. And I'm not, I'm not being critical of it. This is one of those rare times where I might add a little bit of a risk premium for management succession. Because clearly, these, these, two, these are the founders. These are the tech people. They've seen this company through a couple of Evolutions, right? So, just letting you know, this is not a reason not to buy the stock. This is something where we want to make certain that there is a transition plan, right? And if they don't have one, that might get a 25 basis point extra premium in my model. Okay. Last quick. Just kind of touch on your insider holdings. Are they held by the uh, people who founded it, like Dr. Kostad, or can you touch on that? Do you see that as a risk? Yeah, so uh, almost 11% of it is held by Jonathan Burrell. Um, he was a director on the board of, he was a director on the board of directors at Carbon. Um, and he was the first mechanical engineer uh, from 1990 to 2005. Uh, Dr. Ming Kao owns around 10% of it. He's the executive chairman of Garmin, one of the co-founders. Um, to Dr. Bess's point, um, the other co-founder, uh, Gary Burrell owns 1.23%, and then the CEO and President Clifton Hemble owns 0.8%.
Thanks. You got through like 14, 15 questions, and you're still here. Right. Yes. All right. Last but not least, and actually, let's see if we can beat the previous record for you. Uh, <laughs> keep you up here until 3 o'clock. Um, Max, Max, if you could take us away with, tell us how you came about Casey's as well as if there's something you want to address before we get rolling. Yes, for sure. Um, so I'm Max Seaman. Today I'm pitching Casey's uh, General Stores. And so kind of to start with how I picked this company, uh, being from a consumer staples domestic sector, I was really just kind of looking for a company that had promises of growth, maybe some new innovation, but as I quickly found out in the consumer staples industry, not many companies out there kind of innovating toilet paper and avoiding their groceries. So then I ran into Casey's and I remember telling some people and everyone kept me with the same response like, oh, Casey's has the best pizza in the United States. And so I remember having on their uh, investors relations site and seeing them advertise as the third largest convenience store and the fifth largest consumer in the United States really kind of spoke volumes to me about their unique business model. So after analyzing their kind of financials and seeing that their revenue had grown like 80% just by the quarter two. I was like, hey, this is this is the growth I've been looking for. See that unique growth in their stores was kind of kind of the main reason why I picked them. But then uh, to happen to a question that I've been receiving a lot of is how my competitors and my comps. Um, seeing that cases gets 55% of their revenue from fuel and then another 44% of their revenue from groceries and prepared food. I had a really tough time finding competitors that had that same business model of the fuel and the convenience store aspect of it. So to kind of fix this problem, I picked two oil companies in uh, Murphy and Sunoco, and I picked two grocery stores, kind of more typical grocery stores, and rice markets and village supermarkets, and I weighed them all the same just kind of to have the most fair balance of convenience stores and oil companies. And so from there, I can open it up to questions. Brett, take us away. So obviously, Casey, uh, you know, one of the biggest threats is inflation. How did you model inflation? Yeah, so for inflation, I really just built it into my whack and added up. It was a 25 bit premium to kind of uh, just deal with the inflation. Okay, and then, uh, but just going off of that, you have operating margins uh, increasing in the next few years. Do you think that, you know, like rising wages and like how, how is management said they're going to combat? Yeah, I'm definitely in the operating aspect of inflation, those labor wages increasing. I increased my operating expenses largely in kind of for 2022, kind of to deal with it in the present. And then another aspect to increase those operating wages was from the acquisitions. So then I did lower it and increase my operating margin just because those operating, the, the operating expenses from acquisitions won't be there in the following year. So that's kind of where that increase in operating margin comes from. If this quarter do get out, I get two, three, and four over here. Yeah, so how do you feel about uh, your company's new management, and do you see that as a big risk? Yeah, definitely. I think I see management as actually kind of a mini driver, per se. Um, our present CEO came in in 2019, and then our CFO is new in 2020. And I really like the work they've been doing. They've been aggressive. You see kind of from the three acquisitions, they have planned on implementing 350 new stores. Then you see they're the ones that introduced the private label mix. They're the ones that got the partnership with DoorDash and Uber Eats. And so it's kind of this act there, this aggressive approach that has been really driving Casey's, I think, for in 2022 and in the future. And then I would like to add that these, uh, the, uh, Darren Rebellas and Stephen Bromwich came into Casey's not because of any like fraud or problems with uh, past management. It was just a natural retirement. So that, that's how they took over. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, great work, Max. Follow up. Really great presentation. You kind of touched upon it with Brad's question, but kind of talked about how operating margins are increasing faster than revenue. What kind of cost saving mechanisms is uh, Casey's doing to kind of drive up or I mean, reduce margins and kind of see that growth? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, let me just to clarify your friend that their actual results from 2021 on that. Uh, I'm talking like for the future, what are you projecting? Oh, yeah, okay. so look at the past. Oh, definitely. So, my, uh, for me, just as you see for my revenue growth, I see a 50% increase in revenue growth for 2022. And then there's two reasons for that being kind of just the return of normalcy with COVID. Hopefully, Dr. Krause's B82 variant doesn't cost too many problems for gas. Is that right? But, uh, no, but I think that the kind of the combination of the Return to normalcy 
with more foot traffic, there are three acquisitions of over like 260 stores, but the partnerships with DoorDash and Marines and that, that private label where a lot of those things, those margins, like for example, their private label compared to their other grocery segments, they can have a higher margin on those grocery store products. Um, and then my operating, I kind of touched on this with Brett, but those operating expenses are high right now because of those acquisitions. Um, it just, I see on those acquisitions and their credit card fees because of rising rising gas prices, they've had to charge like higher fees. Uh, their uh, credit, um, okay, when someone's at the pump paying for gas, but that, I should say. So about. just to clarify, yeah, yeah. That we'll come right. back to you. Uh, so you, you can keep, you can rejoin. We're just forward in here. Okay. All right. Hey, Max, nice job. Um, so I'm from a small town in Wisconsin that has a Casey Mini store, and I've had a piece that's pretty good, actually. But I was wondering, a local favorite seems to be Quick, quick Trip, and I know it's Casey's kind of Midwestern, yeah. big in the Midwest, so I'm wondering what's like a big factor that sets them apart from these smaller chains at Quick Trip. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the main advantage I see with Casey's compared to like a Quick Trip or a Sheets out east is just kind of their really aggressive approach to rural communities. Um, like you said, these Quick Trips are kind of big bigger cities or like you'll see them in Milwaukee, but then you take uh, Casey's and I actually, I actually went to Casey's last Friday and I had to drive 35 minutes out of my way to just kind of get that pizza. So it's just that aspect of targeting, <laughs> targeting smaller towns. Um, they, they target, I think the number 50% of their stores are in towns of 5,000 people or less. I think that's ultimately what's going to drive the growth because they're coming into these towns where they're really just run by mom and pop shops. And so they, once they put their foot in the door, they become they become the one provider for gas, groceries, alcohol, tobacco, and all that stuff, so where they can kind of have control over the market at the top. Thanks. Hey. Um, yeah, I want to talk about your back for a second. It seems a little low. Could you kind of walk me through that calculation? Yeah, definitely. So, for my back, I had a weight of equity around 84% with the cost of equity at 7%, and then the weight of debt was 16% with the cost of debt at 2.5%, and, and then that was after just kind of waiting in and multiplying it, I got the rack of 6.28%. And then I did that. Then I added the 25 bit and premium for inflation. Did you test this model with a higher whack and see what the valuation would like? Because what I'm worried about with inflation, I think that you may be understating that risk premium. I'm worried about your whack driving a lot of your DCF valuation. I did run a sensitivity analysis and I actually died can get back to you on those numbers for that, but I currently I don't see it. I think I gave it a fair resemblance for inflation. I'm not worried. Okay. Professor Walker. What's happened? Uh, we're not we're not only talking about the gas prices have risen really dramatically. Last time we've seen such uh, an inflationary increase in the gas price, what's happened to this stock? What's happened to the margins? Yeah, definitely. So I think with the stock, we've seen Rising gas prices really over the last four or five years since 2016. And Casey's has actually seen their fuel margins increase. I think in 2016, their margin was 18 cents per gallon. Now they operate around 35 cents per gallon. And kind of coming back to this current year, they've, they, this past quarter, they saw their, um, uh, their, operator, their oil margins increase by about, about like three cents. And so they really, while well, it's going to lower their margins relatively, it's, not as bad as other gas stations out there. And I think the reason for this is because they're in these rural towns and, um, hold on, well, lost my train of thought here, but they're in these rural towns where kind of, as the only supplier, people still kind of have this need for gas and still have to drive. And so, uh, kind of, they're not really using that demand. Right? Okay. We got seven and eight, yeah. Yeah, so just talking about Uber Eats and DoorDash, uh, some like, especially small restaurants have complained about uh, their fees and cutting into their profit margins. Could you speak to how those uh, fees affect the margins from those sales? And is it worth the trouble of using some of your margins to increase, to add those extra sales from those delivery services? Yeah, for sure. Well, I've actually touched on this on D2L, well, and I've had some trouble kind of finding Casey's numbers on the rates that I to disclose kind of going into that segment and how where the money for the rates is coming from. But what I can tell you is, so we're actually over they typically charge around like a 20 percent commission fees to stores like Casey's, which is a, a decent amount, but Casey's has seen their demand for delivery double um, since they partnered with DoorDash and Eats. So I think uh, the demand kind of outweighs these commission costs from Uber Eats and DoorDash to where it will kind of get their brand out there and kind of almost have like another 
aspect of revenue to where they're targeting customers. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, he answers your question? Uh, yeah, I was about to say that. Did you want to circle back to your point? All right. Um, I'm just a little confused on one thing I read. Um, you said they operate um, in a market where 65% of the stores are owned by operators, who own like less than 10 of them. Yeah. Is that the case for Casey's too? And are they in like a franchise model? No, so Casey's actually has no fan. You can't franchise a Casey's restaurant. So they operate a little over 2,350 restaurant stores. And so basically what I'm getting at with that third driver is with 65% of the market being run by operators who run less than 10 stores, especially it kind of benefits Casey's in a rural aspect community where they can come to these rural towns and they're really run by these mom and pop kind of like pop-up shops. And then Casey's comes in and they just kind of have a new town. Basically what I'm getting at here is there's, we're not going to run out of growth opportunities to where if you look at our map of where we have cases, there's still like eight Midwest states where there's, we haven't really targeted to where I think we can go into. Okay. Let's return to your WAC for a minute. Let's get into your, your equity risk premium in particular. What was the market risk premium you used? If the market risk premium I used was 79. Risk premium or the return on the market? Oh, that was return. Risk, so yeah. far I used it 25 bucks. So. So well, let's try it another way. What was your what was your P bill rate? What was your risk free rate? Two and a half. Okay. So if you use two and a half risk free rate and you use seven and a half market returns, then you ended up at a risk premium of five. Okay. So now we got five, four and a half, we'll go up two and a half, with seven, gotcha. And your cost of debt was how much? Uh two point five five. Okay. So we blended it in. Do you think the two five five is a realistic estimate of cost of debt for your company? Um, I guess my, my answer would be yes, but I think I, I would have to do more research for you to get back to the risk. Let me try it another way. If the risk free rate in the world is 2.5%, and your company is 2.55%, I think that's an accurate reflection of the risk of your company. Yes. We try it a third way because you got the answer wrong. <laughs> Your company is basically exactly barely more risky than the least risky thing on planet Earth, then there's probably a problem. Now, good news is it's a small weight, right? But to get to Mr. Dewa's question, you have it by just saying, hey, I threw 25 bits in and that covers all inflation. I think that's a bit not well thought out for what I expect. That's what I know your skill set is. I still think there's upside, I still think, but I think Mr. Drew's question deserves examination. In other words, did you test out like any percent rack? And if you didn't, if I up to all of us, I'd appreciate it because I think we might be a little low here, and I want to be sure that if we bumped up the whack a percent and a half, it would still be worth the apply. Right. Makes sense? I think it will, but I think that deserves a five. I want my I mean, part two, go check out transfer pizza for God's sake, or a classic slice or something. Like, this is decent, this is the best of, you know, convenience store, but if you're driving 34 miles, 35 miles, you have this. <laughs> well, you and I need to talk pizza. I think I'm trying to have this question that's out there. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to have this question. I love your second part. Yeah, because they've gone for basically no or no private label to as much as how much? Uh, they're at 4% right now with the goal of being 10%. Well, it will be 10%. Margins are going to improve. Well, yeah, this isn't poo pooing your story at all. It's a good story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, did you pass through that in? Is, is that true? Yeah, so that, those margins kind of are the reason for my growth in uh, kind of 2023 and beyond. That's how I do with your earlier question that was exactly. asked about margins. Right. I think you could defend that if they're living for a private label now. All right. Well, it turns out you almost did your own marathon session. You are also relatively dry. I think I might see some scores. Good job, everyone. All right. Thanks for that concludes the third week. Uh, we're continuing this every Friday. Nice job today. Two international, two domestic. Next week we'll have five more. Uh, good Q&A. Uh, nice job, everybody. We'll talk about buy sales right now. Okay. Enjoy the weekend. Uh, see you Monday. I am just